Tonight's speaker, Steve Gottlieb, is an honorary lifetime member of this club. Tonight's the third talk he's given to us, and he's been an active visual observer since 1977. He started with a six-inch reflector. He currently has a 24-inch F3.7. Um, he's observed the entire NGC catalog, new general catalog. He's visualized all of it from the United States. That's 7,100 total objects that he's observed. He's also logged over 11,000 deep sky objects. These observations have been used to make numerous historical corrections to the catalog. Now, I've gone up to him at Lake Sonoma years ago, very quiet, very serious. I dare not interrupt. I didn't know what he was doing at the time. <laughs> but he was doing this wonderful work with a group of people called the NGC IC Project. He was compiling the databases for corrections from historical observations. Let's say 200 years ago, someone said, that's a whatsy, and it's right there. Someone else said, no, no, that's not. It's over here. And it's, so he went through the historical archive of many different astronomical observations to see what they said, what it was, where it was, and he's gone through this wonderful series of corrections of the database. Uh, he compiled them now into computerized digital setting circles. So if you have a Lumicon or a Celestron telescope, probably other telescopes, you turn it on, you find your guide stars, and you say, go to. We can thank Steve that it hit the mark that it was correctly identified and correctly labeled. So, you can't so, it if it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So he also selected objects in Orion's deep map 600 sky charts. He's also written two dozen uh, observation articles in Sky and Telescope magazine, and he currently has one coming out in May on M83, and one in September on interacting galaxies. Um, He's going to talk tonight about something that I'm really excited to hear about, the story of William Parsons, or Lord Ross, did the first visual observations of M51 with his massive 72-inch reflector in the spring of 1845. He'll discuss how our preconceived notions and the knowledge of the nature of the objects we view in the eyepiece affect our perception. I've gotten so that I look with what I call a Hubble eye. I'm looking, it's a fuzzy something, but I've seen it from Hubble. So I know that that little work over there is rich with detail. So I'm seeing it with a per perception of having seen it with a bigger, a bigger object. So I think that that's what was the beginning of this kind of thing that Lord Ross bought. And it's one of the great values of this lecture that when you hear people like Steve talk about things you might see in your telescope this spring, fall, and summer, um, he's going to tell you rich things about it to make it more interesting. Please welcome Steve Gottlieb. Thank you, Linda. Um, so we're going to go back in time to uh, the mid-19th century when astronomy basically meant visual astronomy. Um, astronomers basically tried to make sense of the universe by looking through their telescopes, uh, whether it was the Herschels um, or the other, astronomer, other astronomers at uh, a number of observatories that uh, followed the Herschels. And astronomy um, kind of moved along uh, slowly. The, the main advances were by building larger and larger telescopes that could resolve more and more detail, and kind of culminated in the mid-19th century with uh, the largest telescope uh, of the time, in fact, until the 100-inch on Mount Wilson, namely the 72-inch uh, uh, giant reflector of William Parsons, the third Earl of Ross. And uh, we'll learn about some of his discoveries in this talk. So first of all, all visual uh, astronomy basically uh, needs to begin with Charles Messier. Um, he was the one who discovered M51 on, uh, in October of 1773. Uh, it was just accidentally was observing a comet in the area. And here's his description. He just called it a very faint nebula without stars. Um, below the star <coughs> Eta, the second magnitude of the tail of Ursula Major. And uh, he went on and discovered 44 
nebulae, as they were called. These were just fuzzy patches in the sky using a three inch refractor and a seven inch reflector um, from the middle of Paris. <laughs> and um, it, he, he ended up discovering 16 comets and in 1781 compiled the famous Messier catalog of comet imposters, basically. And they are the most popular deep sky uh, observing catalog, uh, well, over 200 years later. Um, uh, the next sort of uh, person in our story is Johann Bode, who was uh, director of the Berlin Observatory in the late 18th century. And he's the one who discovered M81, by the way, as well as M82, um, which currently has a supernova. But uh, that's sort of another story. I don't want to get off on that. And he observed M51 in 1774 with his three-inch refractor. And, uh, had a little more detail, he called it a faint luminous nebula, possibly of an oblong shape, and uh, made a little diagram or a sketch of M51. This is about all you're going to see in a three inch telescope, anyway, so that was his sketch of M51. And um, let's see, maybe I will move on to the side a little. And um, next person in our story is William Herschel probably the greatest visual observer of all time. Um, he discovers Uranus in 1781, I believe, with a six-inch telescope. Um, and a couple years later, he begins nightly sweeps for nebulae uh, from England, from his home, and which continues for almost 20 years. And um, from the time he starts, basically, there's the 100 known deep sky objects that are in the Messier catalog, and by the time he ends, that number has been increased to 2,500 from 100. And uh, his observations were published in three catalogs, 1,000, 1,000, and 500. So 2,500 objects he discovered and, and um, published. Um, he did try to, he wasn't just a, a mapper of the, of, of the skies. Uh, um, he did try to um, make sense of the universe. He did have a uh, cosmology, and he published several articles. Um, but he basically, so it, most of the objects he found of these 2,500 were these faint fuzzy patches in the sky that the, the astronomers of the day had no clue what they really were. Uh, they were just called nebulae, fuzzy, fuzzy objects, fuzzy um, spots in the sky. And um, he felt that they were basically star clusters, but were not resolved because of either they were so far away or there wasn't sufficient aperture to resolve them. Yeah. Yeah. So my understanding is, you know, most astronomers didn't believe there were other galaxies in the Milky Way until about 1920. Here you're talking about deep sky and distance. Can you say more about what was believed, you know, in Herschel's time? Um, yeah, I, mean, I don't think there was a conception that the Milky Way itself was a galaxy okay. anyways. Um, um, these, these easily could have been nearby objects. I mean, there's not much difference between the relatively nearby, um, uh, excuse me, let's go back, uh, clusters and um, not even clusters, just things like Planetary nebula, emission nebula, like the um, you know, uh, and reflection nebula that are part of our own galaxy, and the distant objects we now call galaxies. They were just all called nebulae. Their distances were absolutely unknown, and so there was no conception that there were these were ex objects that were outside our galaxy, whatever that was. So you're saying that there wasn't really a clear feeling about our no, galaxy or no, there was at the time? Not, not really. I mean, there was um, uh, philosophical ideas that, um, you know, uh, about what, our, what the Milky Way consisted of. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of touch on that a little bit. But, um, 
Here's a picture, actually, of Herschel um, sitting on astride his telescope, getting in his sort of observing position. This was his favorite telescope he used for observing, 20-foot focal length, um, and a 18-inch, uh, we call it an 18-inch metal speculum mirror at about 70% reflectivity. Um, and he used these to discover all um, all, all 2,500 of those objects. Um, and he did observe, or recorded anyways, M51 four times. Uh, here you can read his dis visual description of, with an 18 inch of uh, M51, specifically, that's just M51 there. Yeah. Not exactly the modern mount on the telescope. <laughs> Correct. Um, it is the telescope um, basically was designed originally that it could be um, moved in azimuth, but, they, but um, after a while it just became too cumbersome and it just was used basically as a, uh, a meridian scope. And you just, you just let objects sweep through the telescope. Okay. And that's how they were discovered. Okay. And um, this telescope was also built by Herschel. This was his massive, um, what was called the 40-foot telescope. It had a 48-inch mirror, and he had to uh, um, plead with, make several requests to King George to, uh, to help finance this telescope. It was the largest in the world for 50 years. But he really did not like this telescope. It was pretty hard to use. He did immediately discover, I think even possibly the first night he turned the telescope to Saturn, uh, to the moons of Saturn, but he, he did, never used it to discover nebulae. And apparently there's no records that he ever looked at M51 with this telescope. Because if he did, it's most likely he would have seen a lot more than he read in that last description. Uh, he, his cosmology sort of changed several times through the years, but um, basically he uh, believed the universe started with widely distributed stars, kind of a soup of stars which slowly condensed into larger collections of stars, kind of like our, our Milky Way under the influence of gravity. And eventually these fragmented into smaller clusters individual clusters, and then gravity condensed the clusters further into dense globulars. Well, one thing they were, he and others after him were quite confused about was where planetary nebulae, like the ring nebula and the um, uh, dumbbell nebula, fit into things. Uh, he felt like possibly that was like an end state. And that, that, that was that the globulars even collapsed further into forming a um, uh, a planetary, but that sort of changed through the years. Um, in 1790, he discovered the planetary in Taurus, NGC 1514, which appeared to be a star surrounded by a luminous fluid that sh showed no indication of modeling or unevenness. So he, at that point, he decided there was such a thing as just glowing gas that might eventually form stars, but did not consist of stars at this time. It was just some kind of luminous fluid. And uh, this is just a some amateur's IP sketch of NGC 1514. If you haven't seen it, this is just what it looks like in a telescope. You can see that's the central star. And I'm not going to get into the evolution of stars, but we now know planetary nebulae are um, the end product, oh, well, we're near, not the end product, but near the end life of, of uh, stars, normal stars on the main sequence like our own sun. It's a stage that happens after red giant stage. And this is his son, John Herschel. He discovered an additional 1900 nebulae in clusters from Slough, England, and he brought his 18-inch telescope, basically his father's design, on a ship to the Cape of Good Hope. 
and observed there for four years and discovered hundreds more uh, objects in the southern hemisphere. And he recorded M51 six times. And here's his description. It's a little more interesting. It, he mentions a resolvable kind of light uh, with a double ring, or rather one and a half rings, um, like an armillary sphere. And here's his sketch of M51, which is kind of interesting because that double um, sort of uh, consent, almost uh, overlapping um, circles there, or the double ring, is basically the one of the outer spiral arms at M51, but he did not recognize it uh, as having a spiral shape. Um, just described it, as I said, as a double ring, or one and a half rings. And he makes an interesting analogy that if this was, if this consists of stars, this object, then it <clears throat> would present to a spectator placed on a planet on one of these stars or planets, eccentric, eccentrically situated towards the northwest corner of the central mass, that the, the view would be similar to that of our Milky Way. So he had an idea that possibly this object was similar to the Milky Way. We're talking about external galaxies, but didn't really, um, it may just have been, um, he never really thought that necessarily said that this is another Milky Way. Um, he did, again made the comment that nebulae in general are nothing more than a cluster of distant stars. So that takes us to around 1840. At this point, remember, Herschel, the Herschels were um, professionals in their own right, but um, there were professional observatories um, that started building large, um, very precise refractors that were starting to measure positions of stars um, very accurately. Uh, the largest refractors were 15-inch refractors in Pokova, uh, Russia, and Harvard. And um, they observed nebulae at that time, all the distant, all these little fuzzy patches in the sky. But in, if you go through all their records, the term spiral never occurs. So here's, that's probably, that's a 15-inch refractor, I think. That might be the one, at, was it Harvard? That's the one Harvard. Does. Yeah. And now we come to William <coughs> Parsons, the uh, third Earl of Ross, who was um, basically a wealthy amateur who was also a very talented engineer. And uh, he wanted to build a telescope large enough that he could settle this question, are nebula really just a collection of stars that are so distant that um, we cannot uh, resolve them, but if I build a big enough telescope, I'll be able to see all, I can, I'll be able to see stars in everything. And here's the first telescope he built in 19, 1839, kind of a prototype to his large one. This is a 36 inch reflector uh, he built. And um, he commented in 1843 that a great number of stars were clearly visible in it because that's what he was interested in. Could you see stars in these fuzzy nebulae? Um, though he didn't really say, he said Herschel's ring was not apparent, or at least no such uniformity as he represents in his drawing. And, uh, and another little note he made, uh, two friends who we'll hear more about in a minute, both saw the center of M51 clearly resolved. This, that's completely false. They may have seen a couple, they may have seen some modeling in it, they might have seen a couple of foreground Milky Way stars, but no, no distant galaxy can be resolved in any uh, Earth-based telescope. So, um, like, like we're talking about, the center, like a globular cluster, like M13. Here, so here is his 72-inch Leviathan, built in 18, well, built 
finished in 1845. This had a speculum mirror, had 70% reflectivity, like I told you, and there's two reflections. That brings the total amount of light gathered at the eyepiece, uh, which of course lost a little more light, but 50% uh, basically of the total light uh, hitting the mirror. This has a 53 foot focal length. Wow. Of course, you know, you can see the, um, let me see here. I mean, you can see the observer would sit up here, uh, you know, and look through the eyepiece on the side of the telescope. Um, here's the mirror, uh, sort of a, um, a watercolor of the mirror uh, here being uh, basically carted over into position to the telescope. Steve? Yeah. How would the light gathering efficiency of that telescope compare to a modern telescope? You mean as in terms of just aperture? Uh, How about, I mean, if you if you just go through the number, it's it's at least a fifty inch, even you know, uh, telescope. Um, <coughs> but um, it lost its reflectivity very quickly. It did not stay at that seventy percent um, level, probably particularly in the climate in the, the climate in Ireland that long. So it degraded quickly and. Uh, <coughs> probably had to be repolished fairly often. Yeah? It looks like it, uh, the telescope could only move in... Uh, yeah, the telescope is in between these... Like not an so it, is, it can, all it can be done, all they can do is pull it up and down. That's it. And so it, just, it had a little bit of flexibility, I think, between the walls. But you know, it could not move. There was no provision. It was just totally observed on the meridian. Okay. Uh, just well, it. it has about uh, a, a few one, degrees. One, well, it has one hour of uh, lateral one, movement. Okay. So that's that's what they could do. Okay. Okay. Um, so here's actually um, th this is actually Lord, one of Lord Ross's uh, mirrors. Um, this picture was just taken uh, very recently by Bob Douglas in the London Science Museum. The mirror is not in Ireland right now. It's mm -hmm. in England. And um, you can sort of see the uh, mirror. It's, it's, uh, it was saved. This one was saved anyways. Actually, if you go back to the other slide, uh, uh, in the background is the three-foot telescope, the 36 inch. Uh, yeah, it's over here. Right there. Right. There it is. OK, so they had first light on this telescope in February of 1845. <laughs> and they just commented, um, they observed Sirius and the star Sirius and some nameless clusters with friends, James South and uh, Romney Robinson. Uh, and, uh, and these are his two friends, his observing buddies. Um, Sir James South, who was a double star observer, and the Reverend Romney Robinson. And their first couple of observations, they started to look at nebulae. And this little paragraph here, you can see Romney Robinson said um, that the central nebula, the, the core basically of M51, is a globe of large stars, which it is, of course, a galaxy of stars, but there's no way they could resolve it really uh, into stars. Um, but it is also seen with 560 power that the exterior stars are condensed in a ring, and many are spread over its interior. So there is a comment, but you'll notice it mentions they were observing at 560 power. That's because their purpose was to try to resolve it. They wanted to use as high power as possible. The higher the magnification, the more, the better they can spread the stars apart. And at 560, with a small, narrow um, uh, eyepiece that they used at the, that time, only had a couple of arc minutes um, of the galaxy. So they were not able to get the see the whole view of M51 at that magnification. Okay. Also, James South said M51 was the most popular object. It was resolved into stars. And then he also mentions M94 was resolved into a large globular. M94 is another galaxy. They could not have resolved it. Um, and as I said, spiral structure was not noticed. Um, 
So why was it sort of missed? Um, well, first of all, I just I sort of mentioned this before, but just up here I just want to talk about during the 19th century, the most popular uh, theory was uh, Laplace's nebular hypothesis, hypothesis, which claimed that there was there was true nebulous material, a luminous gas or fluid, um, and that material, through the process of gravity spinning and, and condensing and contracting, formed planets, stars, and clusters. But one of his observing friends, the Reverend Romney Robinson, who had a very strong religious perspective that um, and that, that sort of represented, in a way, a form of evolution of the universe that planets are currently being formed. Um, he didn't believe that, and he was adamantly opposed to the nebular hypothesis. And basically, he hoped to use Lord Ross's telescope as proof that all of these nebulous objects were, were not just pure gas. They were actually just stars that would be resolved under the power of this great Leviathan telescope. So that was his focus. In fact, he said, no real nebulae seem to exist among so many of these objects chosen without bias. This is what he wrote uh, soon after they first made the, their first observations with Ross's telescope. They all appear to be clusters, which again is not true. And uh, he was probably the ideological leader of the trio and led the observing, probably picked the eyepiece and the magnification. And they probably did put in a finder uh, eyepiece. They probably had a low power eyepiece. But if perchance he saw um, some spiral structure, well, spiral structure looks like some whirling mass that's condensing. You know, it looks like a whirlpool. That's the nickname of the galaxy. Um, he probably uh, rejected that or didn't see that in his mind because that went against his uh, beliefs. And, it, and probably switched to a higher magnification in any case very quickly because that was his main focus was to see if the core of M51 was resolvable into stars. Um, and once he saw stars there, he probably probably turn the scope over to Lord Ross. You, know, you take a look now, and you can see what the field was. It may have been only as small as three arc minutes, which is basically just the core of M51. You would not see the spiral arms. So, yeah, so Lord Ross does go back to M51 um, the next month, probably around the new moon, April 6th, when M51 was on the meridian uh, around a little after midnight. And because he later wrote, even though there was no observations, he, never, he didn't take any notes, but he did write that M51 for the first time was examined and its spiral character immediately noticed. He later wrote, Dreyer, who, I'm sorry, Dreyer, who was an assistant uh, on uh, Lord Ross's telescope, later wrote that. Um, so he observes alone this time, and probably experiments with different, oh, those are the uh, workers, by the way, with the mirror there at the time, uh, before it was, well, it may have been before it was in the scope, or it may have been the second mirror, I'm not sure. But in any case, uh, Lord Ross experimented with different magnifications. He wasn't pressured by Romney asking him to verify that he saw stars in it. He could just look at the beauty of M51, and all of a sudden, he sees spiral structure, uh, spiral arms in M51. And later he makes the comment, um, when certain phenomena can only be seen with great difficulty, the eye may imperceptibly be, in some degree, influenced by the mind. Meaning, he didn't, they didn't see it when they all observed together, but that may have been because they didn't want to see it, or they didn't, they didn't look for it, and they didn't know what to look for. So, so this is 1845? This is 1845, April. Mm -hmm. April 1845. This was the sketch he first 
sort of a preliminary sketch he made of M51. The um, stars, the stars themselves, he, he, he put in the stars based on uh, using the thir his uh, 36 inch, but then sketched the galaxy around the stars using the 72 inch. And this was the drawing he passed around at the British Association in Cambridge in June 1845. That was his first completed sketch of what M51 looked like in this telescope uh, in April, uh, in April 1845, and handed around. And of course, people were uh, the other astronomers there were kind of shocked or didn't almost couldn't believe it because at that point all these nebulae just looked like little fuzzy patches. They didn't have a whirlpool appearance like this. And uh, here is the um, first publication in 1846 in a book by John Pringle Nichol. Again, it's, it was, I, this was uh, kind of the negative of the one you saw before. Um, M51 was also sketched later at Burcastle by other observers. Um, this is William Rambaugh in 1848. Here's a sketch of what M51 looked like. Here's another one Lord Ross himself did in 1848. This is a famous, um, you'll often see this in books, this, this, this sketch right here. And uh, this was another observer in 1864, kind of a little more like a schematic. It's not quite so realistic. It sort of has a certain artistic style to it, more stylistic than realistic. Um, um, there was other drawings of M51 um, that were done by other observers. This is um, William um, Lasselle. He did this in 1862 with his own 48-inch reflector that he took to Malta. And um, actually, uh, the our next article I have in Sky and Tell is on M. 83, and William Lassell is the first one who discovered spiral structure in M83. Uh, it, was, it was too far south to view it from uh, Burr Castle, where um, uh, Lord Ross observed. And here's another one William Lassell did, uh, a different one, uh, the next month of M51. This one was done by, with a 31-inch um, silver glass reflector, the first one that was at the Paris Observatory. This is the one that um, uh, Stefan used, like to uh, discover Stefan's quintet. Um, and you can see that is a great sketch of M51 also. Um, there was other spiral galaxies that were, that were discovered um, at Burr Castle. This was the second one discovered, M99. It was discovered in 1846. Beautiful sketch. This is M33. And those are, those little arrows are pointing to H2 regions. Those are large knots of, of uh, large regions of uh, gas and newly formed stars, um, giant versions of the Orion Nebula uh, in our own galaxy. And uh, those, uh, it's kind of interesting, those actually do not, oh, the one at the end, I believe this one, it's probably this one. This one does have an NGC number, by the way. It's NGC 604. Um, and the other ones, I think, do have NGC numbers also. One of them is 598. I forget which is which. But in any case, those are visible in amateur telescopes. Um, those knots in M33. This is another great sketch. This is M101. And all of those arrows are pointing to H2 regions. I also have an article in Sky and Tell on the H2 regions in M101. And that sketch is unbelievably realistic. 
when you compare it to a, um, a photograph of M101, and you can line up those H2 regions perfectly. <coughs> Besides those, this is just a page out of his, um, one of his printed um, uh, publications that are all, they're, they're not all galaxies, but um, this one's a, uh, a reflection nebula, I think. But these are galaxies, NGC 3184, uh, this is 3395, 3396, I think those are in Leo or Leo Minor. Um, and you can see this one right here is the wingtail galaxy, beautiful, lots of spirals that he observed. In fact, he went a little bit overboard. Some of the objects he described as spirals were, were just um, like planetary nebulae that are not spiral galaxies. So he kind of saw them in too many objects, but um, he was pretty good in discovering spiral. 67 spiral galaxies were reported. Were <coughs> And um, I mentioned William LaSalle. He, this is his, by the way, if you're uh, interested in classical telescopes from the 19th century, this is a 48-inch equatorial reflector that he shipped to Malta. And um, this was his sketch of M83. Uh, that would be in Sky and Tell. And, this one did, as you can see, at an equatorial fork mount, though, of course, it was, the drive was hand, it was hand driven, literally, with a worker um, uh, turning a crank uh, one, once per second uh, to move it in RA, um, or, I mean, not to move it in RA, to move it uh, you know, equatorially. And um, you can sort of see the uh, pulleys. Um, and uh, so, um, and, uh, Lord Ross made the uh, comment this nebula, this was in 1850, this nebula M51 has been seen by a great many visitors, and its general resemblance to the sketch at once recognized even by unpracticed eyes. And it's pretty fascinating, that comment, because the first night, or possibly two nights, that they looked at it, these were extremely experienced observers that looked at M51 and did not see spiral structure, because they didn't know it was there, they didn't believe it, they didn't look for it, but then later after it was seen, probably just he could show it to the general public and say, look at this spiral arms, and well, I don't know you call them arms, but look at the spiral structure, and other people could, would see it at once. And just as an example, Otto Struve later confirmed the spiral structure using a 15-inch refractor in the spring of 1851, as did George Bond with a 15-inch refractor at Harvard. Those two refractors that had not made any mention of seeing spiral structure in any galaxy after Lord, Lord Ross's um, sketch got out, they took a look at it again and said, yep, there's spiral structure. I see it too. You know, once, well, it's a general principle in astronomy. Once something's seen in a, a larger telescope, it's almost always seen later on in a smaller telescope. And here we went from 72 inches to 15 inches. And my first view of spiral structure in M51 was with a 13 inch, um, that I had in the um, uh, early 80s, but um, I'd say in a dark enough sky, particularly if you know what you're looking for, uh, a 10-inch will do the trick. Um, so here is a, I just thought I'd show you this. This is a modern sketch of M51 by a friend of mine, Howard Bannett, uh, made with his 28-inch F4 reflector, he lives in Oregon. I think this was done at the Oregon Star Party. This was seven hours of observation. Some of you might have seen, there was an article he, he uh, wrote in Sky and Telescope about this sketch and how it was made. And um, uh, Excellent sketch, you can 
um, certain features. You can see actually some H2 regions in the arms. You can see the connecting arm to the companion. Um, and I'm just going to go back. Here's a modern image of M51, and you can kind of look at it. It's a little bit rotated, of course, because you can see the companion here is uh, almost to the left or a little bit above the nucleus of M51. Here it's below, but you can sort of see the structure and uh, some of the um, uh, some of the H2 regions in the arms here you can recognize in the arms over here. So, um, I think I'm going to stop at this point. Uh, oops, can I go back? Oh, uh, let's see. I probably can't. Let me see. I may not be able to quickly go through. I'm not sure. The, this image right here? Yeah. Um, I am not sure. This is an amateur image. This is not a professional image of M51. You know, you probably, some of you have probably seen the Hubble image where they practically resolve stars, individual stars, uh, in M51, but um, it's an amateur image. So, um, I'm going to stop right here, because I know uh, Ken is also going to make a presentation, but maybe I can field some questions. Yeah, so during the QA session, I'll uh, just switch computers. Okay. Okay, yes, Mary? Uh, the check turn. Uh, yeah, let's see. which is a relatively faint object, except that they had great big tubes. But, um, right. you know, and for example, the Andromeda galaxy is huge. You can see it naked eye in a dark sky. And, I, you know, it doesn't have as much structure as that, but it also has some H2 regions, I think, and it's really a, a beautiful it, it, object. Yeah, well, let me see. I, I, it may be partly, I mean, M51, M31, you're saying M31? I think M31 is probably literally was too large to look oh, at. Remember, with like with an eight, eight arc minute field or three arc minute yeah. field. Yeah. So of course they could have looked at other nebulae, and they did. They were they were looking at Messier objects, a number of them. I think the first one that they actually, you know, we actually saw a spiral structure in was M51, and it turns out among northern galaxies, it is probably the M51, maybe M33, those are M101, those are the easiest galaxies to see spiral arms in. And they're so, yeah. Really interesting objects. Yeah. Yeah, so two questions. I noticed your talk started in 1730, which is more than 100 years after Galileo made his first observations. What happened in between? I mean, did people not get serious about astronomy until about 1730? Um, well, okay. They didn't really up to that, I mean, until um, until Newton came along, until the Newtonian reflector was really, was really, um, uh, came into its own. Basically, people had a small refractor. We're talking, you know, up to three inches or something, and that, that was it. Um, so, um, there were no larger larger telescopes um, really until Herschel came along and sort of revolutionized things by building large reflectors. I mean, okay. so there was the, nothing the before that. reflector and Herschel was the first to build large yes, ones? Yes, correct. Okay, and then another historical question. When did um, visual astronomy start giving way to photographic astronomy? Okay, well, basically, around, I mean, Essentially, at the wow, end, the color is weird. <laughs> yes, <laughs> at the end of the, um, I mean, they were they were taking images at the, at, at, uh, photography started coming to its own for astronomical purposes, 
you know, at the uh, end of the 19th century. Okay. Um, so everything, the NGC catalog, are you familiar with that? Yeah. Did, came out in 1888, and every single object, with one exception, um, some, one of the uh, nebulosity in the Pleiades, uh, with, that, with one exception, every object in there was discovered visually. So in other words, photography had not come into its own at all until 1890s. There was no astronomical discoveries through photography until the 1890s. <coughs> Yeah. I just wondered if Matt. With the discovery of the spiral structure, was there any angle you know that uh, this might be associated with the shape of the Milky Way? How did that work? Um. Let's change the colors. I don't think as a. Uh, What's happening? Oh, the color. Not as a spiral per se, but William Herschel, one of his main projects was doing star counts in different areas of the sky, counting the, the number of stars, the density of stars per square degree in different parts of the sky to try to discern the structure of the Milky Way. And I mean, it was known that it was basically like... Why don't you go down? Because I have to go past several... Oh, yeah. I, I, um, yeah. I'm sorry, Steve, for interrupting. <laughs> Unchecked show for piles for the oh, display yeah. only. Yeah. And yeah. Now, I think we did RG, RGB one of the. Yeah, uh, there's There, you're changing it. That's fine. Yeah. That's there, fine. Done. You're done. You're done. Oh, you done? I'm sorry for interrupting. Okay. Yeah, no problem. No, perfect. Yeah, so um, the galaxy was assumed to be like a flat disk, um, uh, and the, the general form of the Milky Way um, was was known just by looking by looking at the um, the, the central disk portion, the, the central disk portion of the Milky Way. Um, towards Sagittarius, but more just the um, the, mel the visible Milky Way that we see in the summer and winter time, uh, but not that it had spiral structure. I, I've never read structure. Not spiral structure. Yeah. When did they start thinking of what they were seeing in these galaxies as as a galaxy? Um, and, and when? How did that uh, coincide with their Thinking in terms of the Milky Way as being a separate galaxy. Well, I mean, once once image once they start once you start taking images, you start seeing um, you start seeing clusters and knots like like some of the the even visually I showed you in M thirty three and M um, one hundred one and those those knots are those star forming regions are generally in the arms the spiral arms. Of course, spiral arms are the spiral galaxies are only one type of galaxy, of course, but those are associated with the spiral arms. So, you know, it's not too much of a leap to see those types of knots and clusters in our own galaxy and make the leap that they trace out the spiral arms, which they do in our own galaxy. Um, and then the data from the counts of stars and the density of stars would have supported the fact that it was a flat object you Correct. Know, where the density dropped dramatically once you were off the um, the disk of the Milky Way. Yeah. 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 Is it not true that uh, the first stars resolved in another galaxy was done with the 100-inch telescope on Mount Wilson? And that was uh, specifically yeah. The 100 inches is the one that resolved stars. Well, yeah, stars were resolved. Um, are we talking about the Cepheid variables? No, 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 I'm talking about actually resolving individual stars uh, yeah. in another galaxy outside of our own. Right, right, uh, right, right. right. <clears throat> memory serves, that was uh, the one. I mean, that's how, that's how the distance to galaxies was established. Yeah, and we, By, as I was saying, by the brightest individual stars that could be resolved were Cepheid variables, they're called. And they're similar, they're, they're in our own galaxy. Right. And 
their their brightness, their the, the period of the, the period. exactly. Yeah. So once they discover those in Barnard's galaxy in M31, then they had a cl an idea how far away they were. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. How did people who were opposed to the idea of cosmic evolution respond to the observation of spirals? Um, well, I mean, this I, I, I suppose this wasn't the uh, the death note for Romney Robinson believing that there was, um, you know, that all the stars and planets hadn't already formed, but I believe the first um, spectroscopic um, analysis of a planetary, um, which showed it as a gas, um, wasn't too, you know, was, you know, happened, you know, within, happened in the later part of the um, 19th century, you know, so at that point they knew these planetary nebulae were, and, and also emission nebulae were not stars but were, were, were glowing gas. Um, so it wasn't until really a, a, a spectroscope was attached to a telescope that the light analyzed that that was really the final um, proof. Okay, well, uh, maybe I'll, okay, well, I'll stop so Ken can...